This web-based seminar will specifically cover screening, diagnosis, and treatment and management of patients who are taking anti-tumor necrosis factor agents or TNF-alpha inhibitors, as they are more commonly known. The seminar will consist of an overview of the interaction between TNF-alpha inhibitors and TB infection and disease, and a review of the latest recommendations for physicians prescribing these agents, as well as physicians diagnosing and treating TB in patients already taking TNF-alpha inhibitors. Our faculty member today are Ms. Linnell Phillips from the Heartland National Tuberculosis Center and the University of Missouri, and Dr. Jerry Jaquette from the New Jersey Medical School Global Tuberculosis Institute. After this introduction, Ms. Phillips will provide a review of TNF-alpha inhibitor treatment in tuberculosis. This will be followed by Dr. Jaquette, who will present a case. We will then have time for questions and discussion. And now we're going to begin with Ms. Linnell Phillips. Linnell is a nurse consultant with the Heartland National Tuberculosis Center. It's on the faculty at the Sinclair School of Nursing at the University of Missouri. She spent several years at CDC, first in their vaccine program, and then as a TB public health advisor, and has published extensively in the field of TB transmission. Linnell? Thank you, Dr. Reitman, for that introduction. Um, I will be talking about um, uh, TNF-alpha uh, inhibitor treatment as part of this webinar. Um, and specifically on the objectives, uh, we're going to talk about what is TNF-alpha anyway and why do we care about it in our world of TB infection and disease prevention and control. And then we're going to review the screening and treatment recommendations um, so that we can best um, assure that patients taking these medications um, um, are as protected as they can be against tuberculosis. Okay, so um, first, let's um, learn about TNF alpha. Any what what is it anyway, and why do we um, why are we concerned about it? Here's a diagram of um, taking us back to our biochemistry days. Um, at the cellular level, in um, the cell-mediated immune response system, the uh, TNF alpha does play. Um, a critical role in the whole cascade of events that needs to happen um, as part of your immune response. Um, it's early in the process, and um, as you can see here, we have an invading uh, microorganism, in this case the TB bacilli, and, and the uh, macrophage phagocytes, the invading bacteria, and then thus releases um, TNF-alpha into the process. As the macrophage consumes the TB bacilli, um, it basically uh, takes one for the team. And it's um, f for um, the easiest way to describe it is it's killed at this point and um, thus suspending whatever activity the invading micro uh, microorganism um, was about to happen. So um, certainly this is an important process. And what this all adds up to is basically granuloma formation. Um, which in the world of TB control, that's a very good thing. This is what um, latent TB infection is, and this is what keeps um, our patients from activating their TB. So we like for this to happen. However, in patients with um, diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, certainly um, the TNF-alpha process that I just described has basically gone haywire. And these patients have produced too much TNF-alpha. It's found in very high concentrations in a rheumatoid joint, for instance. Uh, and um, a drug that is able to inhibit this process would be a very good thing for these folks because they certainly have too much of it going on and they're suffering greatly from that. 
uh, in vitro experiments have shown that it induces uh, cytokines in the synovial cytokine network, and experimental models demonstrate that arthritis is suppressed by TNF inhibitors, and this is early information for our, our rheumatoid arthritis patients. But basically, it, it inhibits um, the formation of too much granuloma. So the mechanism, mechanism of action here is, um, it, um, the, as we discussed, TNF-alpha induces macrophage um, ap apoptosis or death after bes bacillary infection. This is needed for the formation of granuloma and for patients undergoing um, treatment with TNF-alpha inhibitors. The uh, granulomas don't form, and in the case of the um, MTB, um, a latent TB infection, the, uh, there is a failure of the um, uh, body's ability to keep this infection in check. And certainly um, the unfortunate thing that has happened is that we've seen um, some big bad cases of active TB and high mortality rates. So what you have is a person that um, uh, is suffering from rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease or psoriasis, some of the um, autoimmune diseases in, involved with the malfunctioning of the system, and they also have the misfortune to be have latent TB infection. So they're sort of caught in a paradox at this point, um, or a catch-22, where, um, and and f for one reason, you certainly would want to assure that the TNF alpha process is not inhibited, and for another reason, you would you do want to inhibit the um, uh, TNF alpha formation. So very difficult. Uh, patients to sort of treat and know what to do. Here um, we have a um, picture of what goes on here. The TNF-alpha inhibitors are um, these substances right here. They bind with TNF-alpha, and in the event that your system is making too much of this stuff, then certainly this would be a great medication for you to be able to take. So um, the TNF-alpha inhibitors, what are they? Uh, we have um, Embril here um, that was the first one licensed in 1988. Uh, Remicade licensed shortly after that in 1999, and Humero was licensed in 2002. They all inhibit um, the TNF-alpha mechanism. Um, they're um, licensed for treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, juvenile, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, and other autoimmune diseases um, involving too much granuloma formation. Um, Remicade has been wonderful treatment for Crohn's disease. So um, the patients that are suffering from these types of conditions very much are um, uh, appreciating that these drugs are on the market. Here we have an overview of some of the um, conditions that these drugs can treat um, in summary and um, and here's a slide on effectiveness and if you've ever had a um, friend or a family member that has rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease um, you know that they do suffer and the wonderful thing that this show, slide shows is that um, um, in combination with methotrexate um, you know, we're seeing much improved quality of life indicators here. So these are all statistically significant improvements in quality of life. And um, certainly if you've known any of the patients that have taken these drugs, you know that they feel much better um, having taken them. So um, patients with these conditions will very much want to um, be um, uh, candidates for TNF-alpha inhibitor treatment. Some of the off-label uses, um, anything involving too much granulomas formation. So um, here's some examples of those conditions. Just briefly, um, any autoimmune diseases seem to be responding to this treatment. Um, some of our transplant patients are benefiting from this. So. Certainly, um, several off-label uses uh, for these drugs as well. Okay, so uh, what happened? The world started um, prescribing TNF-alpha inhibitors and um, did not 
perceive up front that um, this may uh, muck up the system maintaining latent TB infection, and the active disease, TB disease cases started rolling in. The FDA has a post-licensing adverse event monitoring system. Um, some of you are familiar with it as MedWatch. And in the not too um, distant future, they had uh, 70 reports of active TB um, come in, which um, flagged a signal in the system that maybe we have something going on here. Um, 47 were in rheumatoid arthritis patients, 18 in Crohn's patients, and five in others as we talked about, you know, some of these off-label uses that are possible for these drugs. So, uh, what was interesting was not only the number of TB patients that were reported, but sort of their uh, epidemiological picture here. 56% um, of them were extrapulmonary, and this is unusual. Uh, for those of you that deal with TB surveillance data, at the end of the year when you're reporting your caseload, typically 15, 20% of your patients will be extrapulmonary, and here we had over half of them were extrapulmonary, so unusual. 24% uh, uh, were disseminated cases of TB. That means the TB infection was flourishing in all all different parts of the body and um, very dangerous situation, very uh, potentially deadly situation. And uh, look at the mortality rate down here. 17% of these patients died. Well, that's terrible. That's uh, a much higher mortality rate than we typically see with TB patients. Um, early on, there was some recognition, too, that um, the embryo patients seemed to have less problem with active TB than the Remicade patients. So. Um, early on, we suspected that maybe there's a different mechanism uh, for our embryo patients that, that um, led to them only having nine reported cases out of these 70. So um, anyway, important surveillance data, always important to report adverse events to the FDA MedWatch system so we can find these things post-licensure. Another um, interesting finding here with these 70 cases was their um, time of onset of disease. And look at this. We never see this in TB. Like we had people um, coming down with rip-roaring cases of TB two to four weeks into treatment. The medium was 12 weeks. Many, Most of the patients were already sick within 18 weeks. This is really unusual for TB. As we know, we're usually looking at active disease happening, you know, three to 12 to 24 months after exposure. And, and here, this is, was very unusual. So all kinds of signals here that something um, needed to be addressed for um, TB control with these drugs. And the United States, we weren't the only ones picking up on this. This says um, post-licensure surveillance data out of Portugal, Sweden, and Spain. And look at these. Um, numbers of um, this, these case rates in um, 100,000 person years, much higher than we typically see with TB patients. So, And then again, the embryo, a little bit lower than the others, still a problem, but um, um, boy, these are mighty, mighty high cases of um, case rates for active TB, much, much more than we typically see. So... In summary, we were seeing a 4 to 11-fold increase in the risk of TB in these patients. Onset typically within 18 weeks, which is really unusual, and, and really high mortality rates with lots of extrapulmonary and disseminated disease. Very difficult to diagnose and treat. Um, certainly not a good situation. Uh, and again, the embryo little bit less active TB with these folks, but still happening. The thought was that perhaps Embryl, those um, complexes that I showed you earlier where the drug binds with TNF-alpha, maybe in Embryl those complexes are a little bit less stable. Um, maybe the, the um, route of administration is a little bit different. We're looking at um, IV bolus dosing like once a month with Remicade patients. 
with embryo patients is sub-Q twice weekly, so maybe that was part of it, but a um, little bit less active TB activity with embryo than Remicade. So uh, that was um, an interesting finding. So, um, as I mentioned, the Europeans were also seeing this phenomenon, and the screening recommendations started rolling out. And why is this important? Well, if you are a rheumatologist or gastroenterologist or a dermatologist, um, you know, and you're going to be interested in screening your patients for a TB, it, it depends on which journal you read and um, who... Um, publishes the journal, but you may be looking at recommendations from Europe as well as United States, and, um, you know, Joe Blow rheumatologists out there might find this very confusing. So um, I thought I'd share with you um, that, you know, um, these recommendations have come from all over, and they may differ slightly between each other and, and with ours. Our recommendations, of course, are from the MMWR. These came out in 2004. The first one, screening patients for risk factors for TB and also um, TST for um, latent TB infection. So um, not only are we screening for risk factors, we are placing um, TSTs on all patients before they start treatment. It's not entirely clear how the recommendation is written, but because um, we are used to screening patients for risk factors for TB and then only testing those with risk factors. So, But it seems these recommendations talk about screening patients for risk factors and placing TSDs on all patients. Of course, we default to the diagnosis and treatment of latent TB infection and TB disease with um, current guidelines. Five millimeter cutoff um, because some of these patients will be immunosuppressed. They will already be on methotrexate. So or um, anti-steroidal, so you'll be cautioned in um, interpreting the TST. And this is a little bit above and beyond what we typically see. Even if you have a negative TST, uh, you may still want to treat that patient for LTBI if they have risk factors or some exposure history um, or some question that they would um, be energic. So, um, Anyway, very conservative interpretation of the TST, um, a lot of focus on screening patients for risk factors and taking their whole picture into account in diagnosing latent TB infection. And this is, um, you know, conservative, um, but because these patients get such big bad cases of active TB, we need to be conservative. It uh, kind of shifts the risk-benefit decision-making there. So. So there you go. Those are um, our recommendations um, in the United States. In an attempt to sort of summarize all the recommendations out here, they in 2007, they came up with a consensus statement. And again, evaluate all patients for LTBI um, before starting treatment, um, history and risk factor screening, physical exam, and screening tests. So um, out there in, um, in Europe in particular, they're really talking about chest X-ray screening as well. And um, we don't typically do that in the United States, but um, uh, they have seen some success with chest X-ray screening and looking for little granulomatous lesions on chest X-ray. So um, again, a very conservative pro approach to latent TB infection screening. Of course, the best the best option here in developing screening processes is to attempt to have them evidence based. So, um, with the lack of evidence, then again, you're going to see this kind of variety of things going on out there. And this compares the um, British and the uh, Americans and Europeans. And you can see the British have a kind of complicated whole thing here with taking into account BCG, which they have to do much more often there than we do here. Um, we just had a straight five millimeter cutoff. Uh, the Europeans refer to local recommendations. And then you can start to see over here um, differences in treatment uh, recommendations, which we'll talk about um, uh, later on. And then um, chest x-ray screening, um, certainly in some 
circumstances or all circumstances, depending on the recommendations. So, um, you know, some variation out there. Um, uh, cut off five millimeter. Um, if they're not immunosuppressed, then I think you defer to the regular recommendations. Um, Two-step testing not clearly addressed. Um, however, if you have someone that this is their baseline test and you need to make sure it's accurate, um, something to think about. Um, chest X-ray screening for all patients, even with negative TST. And then, what about our blood assay tests that are new on the scene? Um, what's going on with them. So still some lingering questions out there and probably a real challenge for our um, colleagues who are not so familiar with TB screening to interpret all of this, as you can imagine. So again, I talked earlier about um, evidence-based, coming up with evidence-based screening recommendations. and. Um, I don't know how you all feel about single-payer healthcare systems that we've um, been debating in our country, but certainly they do have the advantages. Everybody is in the same electronic medical record system, and that makes for wonderful surveillance data. So um, this came out of Spain, out of their um, electronic medical records, uh, where they can monitor kind of on an algorithm um, type format what is what is working and what isn't. So this is the whole potential path a patient could take in TB screening. And where did they see the most cases? Well, they saw them, interestingly enough, out of our patients that did not undergo two-step TB testing. So they did not get the second test. They were erroneously diagnosed as um, not having LTBI and started on treatment, and eight cases came out of that group. And where did the second most um, cases come out of? And these were on patients that did not receive a baseline chest X-ray. So um, two, two screening recommendations that are not particularly emphasized in our recommendations, and this is where the most cases came out of. So I thought that was interesting sort of evidence-based um, information that we can perhaps take into account as we screen our TB patients, or our, our um, um, TNF-alpha inhibitor patients. Now, what about blood assay tests? Well, since 2004, when CDC issued their recommendations, we learned a, we've learned a lot about um, blood assay tests. And um, thankfully, um, folks have um, seen fit to publish this in the literature. Um, this one intrigued me the most. This was a uh, um, experience with a quantiferon gold screening at a rheumatology clinic in. Um, United Kingdom, and they um, decided to whole hog abandon TST screening in favor of quantiferon gold, um, kind of a daring thing to do. They're in a rheumatology clinic. They had 101 patients. Um, they screened them all with quantiferon gold only. Uh, they were very um, weary of having to deal with positive TSTs where they weren't sure if they were BCG-related or not. Um, and they followed these patients prospectively for 30 months. And you, you remember, recall, if you're going to see TB show up in these patients, you're looking at, you know, 12 to 18 weeks typically. So they followed them um, up to 30 months, average of 18 months. So certainly if they were having breakthrough TB, they would have seen it. Um, they did not see any breakthrough TB. They had no new cases of active TB in their negative quantiferon group. So Good news, good um, um, positive information that uh, and evidence that quantiferon gold may be a, um, a reasonable test to screen, particularly BCG vaccinated populations. And here are these data. They are very excited that their positivity rate dropped to only 10% um, here and. Um, the, and again, the negatives, no new TB in these in this group, so that's good news. Um, of course, with uh, quantifera, now you're dealing with indeterminates, and they they had about 10% of their folks they screen were indeterminate on the first test. Uh, but here's their conclusions: the quantifera gold, a good screening tool for rheumatoid arthritis patients, due to start 
TNF-alpha inhibitor treatment. This informative appears to be unaffected by their relative immune competence and um, is useful and potentially cost-effective, particularly in a BCG-vaccinated population. So they had very positive things to say. Here's another study that just came out um, in 2008. And this was interesting. Again, these are 70 rheumatic patients due to start TNF alpha inhibitor treatment. 16 positive on um, Ellispot, 27 were positive up front on the TST. And uh, so, and we've seen this, we've all seen this out there. Overall, the agreement, not so good 73% between Ellispot and TST. And even. Um, here, note that um, four LSPOT positives came out of the 43 TST negatives. So, interesting finding there that we had some false negative TSTs. Uh, Villager kind of put it all together for us in a chart. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using the various screening tests? Uh, so, basically, good sensitivity, good specificity with both, and um, here we go. Here's the big one, influenced by prior BCG vaccination, yes, but with our um, new blood assay test, no and no. So um, good summary information there. Um, what about indeterminates? One thing uh, we want to note here in reviewing these screening tools is that uh, you may be, if you use TSDs for screening a BCG vaccination, vaccinated population, you may be over-treating the false positives and even perhaps under-treating the false, the false negatives. So using TSDs, you're um, basically at risk with some over-treatment and some under-treatment. Um, and clearly this author was um, coming out in favor of using um, blood assay test for um, screening for LTBI in this population. Okay, so the, what about the indeterminates? Well, here was Pratt's take on the whole thing, that he'd much rather deal with a few indeterminates from quantifier gold testing than all the confusion that results from using TSTs in a BCG vaccinated population. The villager um, more recently talked about maybe a 1 to 11 percent uh, indeterminate rate with our quantiferon gold um, folks um, that are screened, and um, maybe more so for quantiferon gold than for T-spot, be just because their their mechanisms are different. Um, and he, uh, Villager, talked about um, that maybe perhaps this is incorrect handling of the probe. You know, you got to shake it uh, vigorously, um, or perhaps some um, you know immunosuppression here um, brought on by treatment. So. Still need to be careful interpreting this. Still not a gold standard, but um, seems to be a better option. Okay, so suppose you have a patient uh, diagnosed with latent TB infection and um, still very much wants to um, try one of the drugs in the TNF alpha inhibitor class. What are the treatment recommendations? And again, um, um, our um, physicians out there, depending on the journal they read, they might be reading treatment recommendations from Europe or uh, United Kingdom or USA, so um, be aware that they vary out there depending on what you read. And here's the other um, question that comes up. Um, do you have them take the whole nine months of treatment prior to um, starting um, treatment with TNF-alpha inhibitors, or um, can they start it somewhere um, in the midst of taking nine months of treatment? Of course, your patients will be pressuring you to take it as soon as possible. So the recommendations here get kind of fuzzy here. Um, we got language like it would be prudent to wait, but you don't have to. They sort of leave it in the judgment of the physician should be made by a thoracic or ID physician. So this is why we're all getting a lot of calls in public health, you know, what do I do with these patients and can they start um, treatment with a TNF-alpha inhibitor before they're done with their nine months and um, how does this work? What does the MMR, MMWR say? 
Preferably, you would want to um, get all nine months in there but um, and consider postponing, but um, again, there's not a lot of evidence-based um, information out there to make a decision. Um, our great observational work from Spain um, indicates that probably one month um, of um, INH before starting um, the TNF alpha inhibitor treatment. The um, National Psoriasis Foundation has weighed in on this one. And um, again, they this is what's the most definitive thing I saw was um, uh, may start immunosuppressive therapy. Um, therapy one to two months in INH treatment. So um, again, a variety of things out there. You'll probably get called. This is the um, post-licensure evaluation from Spain. And uh, look at here, we only have one case um, arise out of the um, INH treatment group. And you know this. You know how what this could be. This could be um, a drug resistant case. You know a, a drug resistant organism that's resistant to INH. So, um, not seeing a lot of breakthrough cases in that group. Okay. So, um, but what all this brings up is sort of an an interesting um, discussion of uh, what happens out there in the medical world and um, following public health recommendations and um in their in their um post licensure surveillance uh you know we talked uh the authors of the um article from Spain talked about um you know why did they have this sort of myriad of things happening when their screening recommendations were straightforward and in fact you know again this is electronic medical record system so when when it pops up, you know, that they're screening someone for TB um, prior to treatment, uh, the, the recommendations appear right on the electronic medical system. So they were a bit, you know, flummoxed that there was all this variation happening with um, uh, what the physicians out there were supposed to be doing. So here's some of their thoughts on the matter. Though they didn't have a straightforward explanation, um, they believe that the... Uh, the, the perhaps this had to do, boy, it was a lot of work and a big ordeal to get him through TB screening. Um, the two-step testing appeared to be a, a major barrier. They didn't feel that was necessary in complying recommendations. And then, uh, more importantly, this is probably quite true, that the you know things were sort of ambiguous or softly supported in, with evidence. So all the more reason you know that it was important that they publish this information. But um, you can see, you know, there's a the, the um, recommendations are a little bit ambi ambiguous, so um, we, you know, we typically, hopefully, will get a lot of questions about um, what needs to be done. Um, in the United States, the FDA took this opportunity to sort of track what happens when they have new screening recommendations come out on a uh, on a post licensing situation um, on a new drug. So they kind of broke it down into three phases here, and um, you know during the second phase they had um, package insert warnings and uh, um, some presentations and so forth. But when when um, the things to, you know they realized how serious a problem this was, they had kind of a third phase of recommendations, and they sent every doctor a letter, and they got a New England Journal of Medicine article and boxed warning. This is when we started seeing the commercials on television and so forth. So they, um, you know, kind of tracked in these three phases how how effective were they. And um, uh, here's what they found in the in the first cohort. Of course, very little was known about TB screening, so um, not much happening there. But look down here. This is the third cohort where um, they have pretty much, you know pulled out all the stops and done all the recommendations they could, and we still have less than 40% of our TNF-alpha inhibitor patients being screened for TB prior to treatment. So um, kind of a bummer here. We wish we were having more compliance with these recommendations. And of course, all of us out in public health know this because we saw all the active TB cases. 
Then they compared disciplines. Uh, the rheumatologists were first to sort of recognize the TB risk um, with their rheumatoid uh, arthritis patients. And then the GI guys came along, and they're, they're treating Crohn's patients, and, and they recognize the risk. So you can see that just by timing-wise, the rheumatologists were much more likely, well, slightly more likely to um, embrace the recommendations than the GI guys. And then the dermatologists, they're not even in, on the map yet. They were sort of the last to come along in considering TNF-alpha inhibitors for treatment of um, uh, psoriasis. So here were some conclusions here. Um, the federal um, risk communication efforts um, did seem to double the TST screening rates. Um, they found that the Dear Doctor letters, it's like who reads the mail anymore, so that wasn't too effective. And um, despite um, all of this risk communication, um, including, um, you know, even my kids heard about TB on the Remicade commercials. They, they said, hey, Mom, they just mentioned TB on television. Despite all that, we're still seeing um, not entirely um, embracing our TST screening recommendations. So, um, however, that doesn't diminish the um, fact that the um, FDA risk communication was very helpful in getting the word out. Here we go. In a, they, in um, sort of a, researching all of this, they did a questionnaire on over 6,000 um, Remicade treated patients. 60% of them completed a skin test questionnaire and reported having a TST, so even a little bit better than the previous finding. But they still had four active cases, and unfortunately, three had a previously um, positive finding for TB on TSTs, and one had even had active TB in the past probably, and none of those patients received prophylaxis. So still some education work out there for us public health folks to do. So what are our challenges? Clearly, effectively promoting recommendations, getting rid of as much ambiguity as possible. Um, they sh um, ideally, they should be clear and consistent. Um, and then be aware of our colleagues in specialty areas that haven't thought about TB probably since medical school, so they um, just letting them know you're out there and that they can certainly approach you for professional advice is a really important thing to do. I took away from this that, um, and perhaps you too, that the, um, the blood assay tests are quite an asset for us for uh, the BCG vaccinated patients, that um, really being able to assure those are available because um, certainly they these folks are suffering from a very debilitating diseases, they're going to very much want this treatment and to put them off for one, two, nine months um, with a positive TST that they might not even think is credible. Um, I think the better option here is, um, you know, to have these blood assay tests available, particularly for that population. Um, we in public health, we really need to make sure LTBI treatment is completed. Really high index of suspicion, even if you do everything right, you know, the the active TB disease in these patients is just tremendously horrible, and um, and uh, they are in mortal danger. And continue to report all cases of TB to FDA MedWatch system. Here's the website. It's because of this post-licensure passive surveillance that we learned everything that we did. So very important to keep reporting any problems you have with active TB in these patients. Okay, well, um, that's what I had here for today. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, so here I have um, the very hard work of my um, MPH graduate student, Dr. Craig Lewis, um, who was um, um, very helpful in completing the medical, um, the um, literature review. So. Um, thanks again for your attention. I think I'll hand it off at this point. Okay, thank you very much, Linnell, for sharing your knowledge and experience and excellent review. We now have some time for discussion, so do we have any questions or comments? The floor is open. This is Mary Louise. 
calling from Erie County Department of Health in Erie, Pennsylvania. Hi, Mary Louise. Go ahead. Um, I have a question. The information um, from um, Lynette's talk, uh, Linnell's talk, um, seems to be only talking about isoniazid as far as treatment um, before or you know starting any treat any uh, other therapy. Why is rifampin not mentioned? Okay, Linnell. The the treatment recommendations are basically you know to, to defer to the um, typical treatment recommendations we use for LTVI. So um, isoniazid is mentioned more because it's the um, you, you know it's the the number one ideal choice. Uh, although I think um, um, folks are starting to use rifampin more and more. But um, you know basically the treatment recommendations just defer to uh, you know what is you know what CDC is currently recommending. Okay, so there's nothing in particular that would say when we're making these recommendations in treatment, it sh it has to be INH. No, no. Um, you know, certainly we just recommend following the the treatment recommendations as they're laid out currently by CDC. Okay. I think that's a good question. Uh, this is Reichman because rifampin is an acceptable alternative. And there are now at least three or four uh, articles in the literature, including one from our institution, that recommend rifampin preferably, uh, and uh, it should work. It can be used for a shorter period of time. Uh, all the articles do not suggest it be used in HIV-infected patients, but Correct. they don't say anything about um, people on TNF-alpha inhibitors. Okay. Other we... questions? Yeah, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say we have in fact used uh, four months of rifampin so that someone who had rheumatoid arthritis could initiate therapy sooner than you know would have been on with the INH. I think that's an excellent uh, reason for using the shorter regimen. Good point. Any, Thank you, sir. Any more questions? This is Dr. Huang from LA County. Um, is there any? Uh, Reports of atypical chest X-ray presentations on TNF antagonist re uh, recipients in terms of TB manifestation besides the typical reactivation, upper lobe cavitation? Yes. Just like uh, with AIDS patients, there's a lot of atypical presentations, and uh, the recommendation is made that physicians become familiar with these atypical presentations. Yes, there can be even, you know, minimal infiltrate and get a positive sputum. Yeah, because wow. uh, on these drugs, you've wiped out the body's ability to for granuloma formation, which is, you know, the um, what you see in thick wall cavities and so forth. You've wiped that out, and so the the disease can disseminate very easily and, 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 and brings us back to the point that having a very high index of suspicion for TB in these patients is really important because it, it won't present the same way. Yeah, remembering that the uh, presentation of TB is in, really based on the immune system, and if the immune system is interfered with, such as in HIV, uh, you get atypical or non-typical, I should say, tuberculosis. I'd just like to make a comment on that. that despite that, our patient did have granulomas um, shown on pathology, and um, there are some references that suggest that for one thing, a tannercept may be acting by a different mechanism, and secondly, that maybe granulomas are um, non-effective. In the mouse model, certainly if you give BCG to mice, um, you can block their ability to form granulomas, and similarly, if they already have granulomas and you give TNF-alpha inhibitors, you can have the granulomas dissolve. So I guess there's a whole range of what you could see in terms of granuloma formation or um, effectiveness. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Can we please have them? Um, this is Dr. Jay Prashad from Columbia, South Carolina. A patient with a negative PPD um, on enterocept, for example, is there any recommendation for repeating the PPD during the course of enterocept treatment? Jerry? I've not seen that. Um, 
But i uh, just make one little caveat. I think the, one of the Lancet articles talks about um, using epidemiologic data on patients to decide whether somebody with a negative skin test maybe should be given uh, preventive therapy or treatment of presumed latent TB infection even without a positive skin test. So if you have a family member and a family where there's been a lot of transmission or some other situation where you're concerned that there likely was a positive test that's now been blunted by energy um, that you might consider giving treatment. But I've not heard the need to repeat the skin test. Um, there, there are people who are talking about two-step testing prior to initiating therapy, and I think that's been batted around a little bit. Um, and it's not, I believe it's not in the official CDC recommendations, but it may be something that will be addressed in the future, whether that would be appropriate to do uh, prior to, to making a decision about whether the patient needs. Linnell, do you have any comments on that? Um, well, um, you know, I mean, if this is a question of, like, sequential testing during treatment, if you have someone that's going to be on for years, you know, would you want to um, do annual TST screening or something? And I, I'm I'm not sure of the value of that. I don't know that it's been addressed in any of the recommendations. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've really focused on upfront screening. If there's any concern that that patient would undergo any exposure, um, during treatment, uh, then you know certainly post-exposure TST testing, but um, and then also if they have symptoms of active disease, I don't, you know a TST might p be part of the diagnostic process. But um, you know at this point, the important thing is to do that very thorough, accurate baseline TB screening up front. That's that's where the the emphasis for the recommendations are. No, I thank you for that. I agree 100%, and I think that this is one of the problems we in tuberculosis control have is getting the outside. We have enough trouble with our own, but imagine getting the outside community, as you so nicely showed, to subscribe to treatment for latent tuberculosis infection in people who don't have objective evidence of latent tuberculosis infection. Well, we have enough trouble getting them to do it in people who do have evidence <laughs> of latent tuberculosis infection. And this is all, as you said so nicely, the training and the education and the raising of consciousness. But I think a couple of lawsuits would do an awful lot to help this along. Any more questions? We have a couple of more minutes left, and we'd love to entertain your questions. Lee, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, this is Ron Carpick in Fairfax County. Uh, Hi, Ron. With regard with regard to the, the treatment of tuberculosis, they added moxie to the ripe therapy, and that's usually that's that's one drug to quote unquote a failing regimen when they may have had this iris syndrome. Would you address whether you would be happy to continue with just one drug, or would you add several when they were trying to rule out reactivation tuberculosis? <clears throat> okay, this is Jerry's case, so we'll call right. her. Actually, Amy Penham was on that. Uh, regimen as well, and we were counting that as the uh, the second drug. And she actually remained on imipenem for a very long time till the culture of the specimen that had been smear positive came back. Uh, I believe it was it was a negative culture. Okay, well that's all the time we have allotted for the seminar today. If you have additional questions, please feel free to email them to us, and we will forward them on to the speakers for answers. We'd like to thank our excellent faculty for sharing their knowledge and experience with all of us. The New Jersey Medical School Global Tuberculosis Institute provides medical consultation to providers in the Northeastern region. Please feel free to call us at our information line 1-800-4-TB-DOCS. This concludes the conference. Thank you for your participation.